All right, guys. Well, now that we've got that all fixed up, uh, quick thing. I need a favor from you guys. And first of all, that is if you are on YouTube, okay? Or let's no, we'll not deal with YouTube. Well, let's deal with Facebook. If you are on Facebook Live, I really need you guys, please, to uh, log in. Of course, let everybody know we're here. Hit that share button. Hit the like button. We want people to know that we're here. We've got a lot of stuff that we're going to talk about today. Uh, we're going to spend a lot of time on one very particular document from the Department Department of Homeland Security, my, if I can speak correctly. So uh, we want to get right to it. Also, I just want to take a moment uh, to talk to all of you YouTube watchers. And for those of you that are on YouTube, I want to um, ask you guys to please like, subscribe. Of course, make sure that you are sharing this with people. Copy and paste it. This will be an important one. Uh, perhaps one of the most important of the year besides the update that I'm going to be doing tomorrow. And I'm going to be doing a big prophecy update. Very excited about that. We're going to go over a lot of things. It's been in the works uh, for the better part of a year. But I did want to take a moment to acknowledge those of you who are uh, the firsts at Super Stickers and Super Chats. Guys, I want to make a comment about those. Uh, for those of you that are on YouTube, those have been tremendously supportive, right? Um, when you guys are doing that, it's a tremendous help to us. It always is, and it's a blessing, and we're really grateful to uh, to you for it. The, f <laughs> the first super sticker is, uh, well, I'm not going to even call him a guest anymore. He's one of my co-hosts. We do this now a couple times a month, if not three times a month. Monkey, thank you, bro. You didn't have to do the super sticker. God bless you, bro. Um mm -hmm artistry ministry uh thank you you super sticker the first super chat is christy wrecker thank you so much you say good afternoon to god be the glory uh l woodward thank you for your kind comments you say god bless you both in the coming new year and chelsea blessed thank you you are blessed thank you for blessing us uh you guys are awesome and of course we are grateful to you for participating that way make sure you let people know we're here it is really important you guys because we've got a lot of very important things that we're talking about and a lot of stuff that's going on. So, Monkey. Yes. You, bro, well, first of all, let's talk about how are you doing? I'm doing great. Yep. Doing things fantastic. good. Yeah. Yeah. I, are you getting ready for the new year? Yeah. I don't do anything on the new year. I stay at home and, and, wise. and I'm in bed by about nine o'clock, man. I'm, I'm a real <laughs> dud. So. I, I'm not doing much of anything in the new year as well. Uh, we are going to uh, do our big prophecy update tomorrow. Uh, we'll have some tacos, that kind of thing. And then after that, uh, we'll be probably in bed right after midnight, maybe. Just in a, enough time to hear all the gunfire. And, yeah. um, and, then, and then we'll go to bed. So, I, bro, I, I, I can't blame you for that. I really can't. Yeah. So that's good. <laughs> Those days are behind me, man. I don't, uh, and I thank God I've got, now my wife is, is a little bit younger than me. And so, uh, but, but she also is the same as me and we're like-minded, right? Equally yoked. So it's, it's good. Awesome, bro. That is, that's a blessing. And a quick mention to the skunk 1996, God bless you. And of course, Deborah, God bless you. Deborah Mueller, happy new year to you. Um, okay, bro. I, I think yeah. we ought to just get right into it. Um, it. you sent a text over, uh, to us. Yeah. This was uh, pretty quick. As a matter of fact, I'm going to see if I can uh, bring this up on the main screen. But you sent a text that involved uh, a project with the Department of Homeland, the Department of Homeland Security. Yeah. Um, it is uh, very, very interesting, actually. Um, it is there. Uh, it was really basically a news release on a small business innovation research pre-solicitation. So in essence, what this is, is correct me if I'm wrong, this is kind of like a, a pre-stage of what they call an RFP, a request for proposal right. for guys to do some things that they need done. Is that is that a, an accurate statement? Yeah, so let me, let me back up a little bit. Uh, for those that aren't familiar with my background, I've spent probably almost two decades in the proposal world, working DOD and government proposals. And so I'm pretty well versed in, in kind of that process. Um, I've been doing, uh, you know, not only submitting proposals, but bringing them in and kind of dissecting them and putting them out to teams of experts for them to bid on. And the way the proposal process works is this. 
they 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 come out with what they call a workshop, right? And so it'll be just kind of a a broad brush. They 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 send it out to who they think fits the mold, okay? And it's usually just a select handful of of people that they believe have the capability to do what they're asking, right? But they put it out there. They have to post it publicly for everybody to see. Um, but it doesn't, usually that supplier pool is pretty tight, right? Um, but they'll put it out there. They'll set up a workshop. They'll bring them in and they'll basically do kind of what they call, um, it's a, uh, uh, kind of a level set, uh, what their, what the requirements are, right? They're framing out the requirements. So they'll bring people in, they frame out what they're wanting, and then they ask for feedback and input for a, a, a small period of time. Questions, right? They'll open it up to questions so that somebody that's bidding, if they don't understand the requirement, they have the opportunity to go in and ask questions uh, to kind of shore up so that when they bid something, they're in scope, right? And so, um, but they've been doing that because it helps the proposal process. Normally to do something, you know, from scratch to implementation, it would take a DOD three years to do it, right? And so uh, this will probably be a quick burst. It's probably, if I had to guess, it's under an annu annual CLIN, which is a cost line item uh, number, it's basically a, a, a cost bucket, right? A color mm -hmm. of money. And so it'll probably be under an annual CLIN, not a three-year CLIN. Um, and so, uh, but, but these, what they do is they'll come out and they'll get all these experts in, they'll get the bids in, and then they'll pull the trigger pretty quickly on, on rolling out with this implement, imp, implementing it. So my guess is that their goal is to have this thing implemented about a year from now. So winter of next year is going to be key. I think that is when uh, this will all come into play. Okay, so we should talk about this, right? Because this, this yeah. is a big deal. I mean, this, this, th this thing is an unbelievable document. It's right there in front of us. There's a lot of terminology that I think we sort of have to kind of get through a little bit, you know, but they're requesting quite a few things. And um, I think it's probably appropriate. I, I can actually put it up on the screen. Matter of fact, okay. that's exactly what I'm going to do just so that we can kind of get it uh, available for everybody else to see here. Okay. And, and I know that it might be hard everybody to see it through my small end of things, but um, I, we should talk about this. We should read about this a little bit. Um, according to this document that's in front of us, the Department, Land, the Department of Homeland Security is requesting, uh, they're doing what they call a pre-solicitation, okay? So uh, let me read this um, really quickly. I'll, I'll start at the top. It says the Department of Homeland Security, uh, Small Business Innovation Research, SBIR program, researched 11 topics for the new Small Business Innovation Research. That's the 22.1 pre-solicitation. During this period, small, small businesses can review topics and ask clarifying questions regarding the topic requirements. So what will happen is they'll they'll say, this is what we want. Businesses will contact them and say, hey, you know, like you said, from their small pool of people that work with them, um, hey, give us a little bit more information on what you want here and what you want there. And then in essence, there's a timeline. They put up their proposal. The proposal gets accepted. They have phase implementations. And I think you're right on the money. I think you are dead on as it relates to uh, when this thing is supposed to be done. So yeah. um, why don't we just go over some of these line by line, or maybe you can uh, point out to us some of the things you think are the most significant, especially with your background, your experience, you know, what you know about this stuff. Um, why don't you fill us in a little bit on this? Yeah, one, yeah, for sure. Um, so that first item right there that talks about the AI alerts, uh, that is, in my opinion, what that looks to be. Uh, it's a little fuzzy on your screen. I've got it on mine too, so I can see it. But um, uh, that is contact track and trace, and and so uh, as you know, that that capability is out there. I mean, it is. They do it today. They have the ability to do it today. Matter of fact, some countries even admit uh, during uh, recent events that they were able to track, you know, like some crazy amount of people, like 30 million people, you know, oh, yeah. uh, where they were, who they who they interacted with. They run a lot of these things behind the scenes and we don't even know it. Uh, but but yeah, that's what that is. That's basically um, contact tra track and trace is what that first one is. It's and it's it's A.I., um, which is, I mean, that's where everything is going now anyway, right? Oh yeah. And, 
I think to, to provide some clarity, can you give maybe a practical application of how they might use this or how uh, we might see? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's say, for example, uh, you had your, your phone with you. OK. Um, and this is on you, on your person. Now, I think I do believe that this will be uh, as you go through and look at some of these these items, that this is more than just holding a phone. Um, it is it's actually set up to where you can't separate yourself from it. And that's what I think is key as we look through this. Uh, but imagine if you would, if this phone was attached to you in your body, you couldn't separate yourself from it. If you were to interact with somebody that was exposed to something, um, it would basically, it would, it, it would let them know. Say for example, um, somebody had a particular, let's say smallpox, for example, right? And you actually, uh, interface with them somehow sitting on an airplane seat behind them. Uh, this thing would, would monitor that. It would know that they had smallpox and then it would tell you that these people around you have been exposed. Right. And then that's how they would basically collect and gather that data. Is that, is that uh, a, a pretty good example without going into. Other yeah. Things? Right. Yeah. Cause I think it could get, it could get really weird, but there's one aspect of this that I'm going to venture out and speak about. And I know, um, of course, you're being very cautious because you know how it works here with the uh, um, with all of the AI that relates to our broadcast. Uh, mm -hmm. But I do think that it's important to note the emphasis here on the automation related to uh, tracking and watching and so on and so forth. Right now, an overwhelming majority of the tracking tools that are available to the government um, at least the ones that are out in the front on your phone require your permission right now. They, there's sort of a, a default kind of a line that's dragged there because in essence, they're all enabled by default on your phones, unless you own an Apple phone An Apple phone will require you to enable them, but they're all yeah. enabled by default and you have the choice to kind of disable them. Right. But right. the kind of, the kind of AI that we're talking about here is the AI that will read between the lines on the type of stuff that you have no control over shutting down. For example, it'll utilize systems like E911. It'll utilize a lot of the um, maps, uh, data that gets transmitted when people are driving, um, so on and so forth. And so this is very interesting. Now, I also wanna make a comment about this as we go through this. There are a lot of guys right now in the prophecy world that are talking about this uh, document right here. I've heard probably three or four now. And what I'm a little worried about is the fact that they're not understanding the technology. So what they're saying is a big deal is most definitely a big deal, but it is nothing like what it really is. There are some right. really serious things that get missed because a lot of the guys don't understand the technology. So I'm really hoping that you can bring to the table some of this because I have a technology background a pretty significant technology background. And that background has uh, sort of had me raising my eyebrows looking at some of this stuff, but probably for reasons different than a lot of the other guys are talking about. So I just thought yeah. it'd be a good idea for us to talk about some of that stuff. Yeah, it's uh, I've seen, I know what you're talking about. And a lot of it is out of scope. It's not really within the scope of what they're, they're telling you here. Just to baseline this, I'll tell you what the end plan is in terms of, what I believe they're asking for here. And that'll kind of put everything into context as we're talking through this. So you'll understand, right? So it is no longer like right now, they, they have the ability to put it, push it out to everybody's phones. Okay. However, you can disconnect yourself from that phone. If I were to take this phone and turn it off, put it into one of my, my Faraday bags or pouches, there's no way they can contact me. I'm off the grid, so to speak, from this perspective, right? What this is, is this is actually putting you into a, a system where you will get either some type of an implant, uh, like, a, uh, you know, or something in your skin or on your skin that will uh, basically you can't separate yourself from it. OK, that's where this is going. And that's what that is, what they're doing. And the reason I say that is because there are some other elements within this um, that indicate that. Uh, to where you can tell if things are being manipulated. And, and if, if, for example, um, you were trying to remove that, there are things in here, and I'll point those out here in just a second, that will, that will notify them that you are attempting to remove that device or that item, right? 
but it is uh, it, it's it's going to capture all your real time diagnostics, right? As you're as you're walking along, everything is going into this AI system, and it's basically telling them your heartbeat, your you know, all your vitals, blood pressure, heartbeat, you know, what you're doing, where your location is, who you're interacting with. It's all going into that that same thing. It's almost like uh, if you remember seeing the Chinese rolled something out called uh, uh, basically like your your uh, social uh, score, right? And, but mm -hmm. in order to do that scores. social score, yeah, right. Uh, in order to do that, they were tracking and tra they they knew who you're interacting with, and they were they were real time grabbing on their grid their social scores. So they know if you're hanging out with bad bad actors, they, they're getting notification of that. So they know your circle has been compromised, right? So people that want to be, you know, perfect citizens don't hang out with people that don't want to be perfect citizens, right? Yeah, I mean it's a it's a it, perfect it's a perfect way of putting it. Okay, so let's look at DHS two two one dash zero zero two. Yeah, uh, let's talk about that next one. You want to read that back? Yeah, yeah. So what that what that is is uh, the rapid deployable countermeasures uh, to protect, basically setting up perimeters and structures. That is exactly what uh, we've been tracking. Um, if you've looked at the CDC green plan, if you have not, and you want to do that, just go out Google search. CDC green plan or green zone. Um, and so that CDC green zone plan is basically that's that what it does is it sets up quarantines at the home level, at the neighborhood level, and then at the camp level. Okay. So that is what they're talking about there. Basically, if you were to ping on your, on your phone and there was an exposure and say it involved 10 people in your neighborhood, they would actually rapid deploy security teams, right, to come out and they would lock down your neighborhood so you couldn't come or go from that neighborhood. That's exactly what that is. So they can do it, lock you down in your house. Uh, they can lock you down at the neighborhood level. Or if they decide to detain you, they will come out and pick you up and bring you to a facility, a.k.a. camp, um, a quarantine camp. Uh, we've seen that actually take shape in Australia. Um, and that is exactly right. You've got that. Um, uh, that place in the Northern Territory there uh, that they're, they're doing it today. They basically, it hold like 30,000 people. It's simply incredible. Yeah. I mean, it, what we're looking at is unbelievable. And it is, again, one of these things that's completely designed to keep everybody sort of uh, at check, right? At bay. And, um, and of course, you know, they, they say this, that it wants, you know, obviously they want to use it for, other types of facilities, but they already have rapidly deployable countermeasures at protected mm -hmm. perimeters as they relate to federal detention facilities and so on and so forth. What they're talking yeah. about here are what I like to call geofences. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or they can come, they can turn that into real fences. It's yeah. um, uh, uh, one of the things that blew me away is that, um, uh, and I didn't know this when I was doing the research for, for this particular information, uh, I ran across some things that were kind of alarming, uh, and that is the fact that uh, the United States currently maintains the largest undocked immigration detention camp infrastructure in the world, including 961 sites, either directly owned or under contract with the federal government. I didn't know that even existed. What got me onto that was that I was looking at the 27 military bases that we are currently converted into you know, uh, immigration camps. And so the reason I key on to that is because these, these immigration camps, um, if you go back and look at our history in world war two, look at German, Germany's history in world war two, all of the camps that they had Dachau, for example, started out as an immigration uh, camp. That was the first thing they did. It was a munitions facility. And then they made it an immigration camp. And then oh. that immigration camp quickly became a containment for uh, political dissidents and the Jews and anybody else that wasn't like-minded in thinking. And so they actually did it here in the United States as well in World War II. And they had these camps that they were, they called them re-education camps, uh, but they brought in the Italians, the Germans, and uh, let me see who else it was, but um, uh, let's see here, Italians, Germany, and I had it up here. I was just looking at it as I, as I completely draw a blank. Uh, but, but yeah, this is, this is a, 
I mean, we've done it in World War II. Uh, it, Japanese, yeah, Japanese, Italian, and, and German Americans. Um, they had camps here in the U.S., but they only had about 14 of them at the time uh, that were military installations. So, so yeah, we haven't done this in the United States, and this is active. This is actually taking shape right now. Um, there's 27 bases that are uh, established as immigration camps here in the United States. That is just unbelievable. Yeah, so that line to item two is is definitely a real deal, and that uh, this all ties. And keep in mind too that all of those bases, the the 27 I'm talking about, all roll up under Homeland Security. So it's the same organization. Yeah. So. Yeah. Woo, woo. And I don't have much to add to that. I mean, you literally took the words and the thoughts out of my own mouth and mind. Uh, let me read 221-003. This is insane, right? Non-invasive and real-time detection of counterfeit microelectronics. Now, this is yeah. kind of a big deal. Yeah, that to me is that that's where you're getting you're getting marked or chipped with something. Um, and you have the ability, you don't have the ability to 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 get rid of it. Um and, and it also has, if, if you tried to uh, EMP it or something along those lines, uh, you know, it's going to keep you from, from basically, you know, tape, tampering with it. Uh, what, what is your read on that one? See, my read on it is uh, Revelation 13. See, because yes. the, the, we, we talk about this a lot and, and we're actually going to go over this in your Sunday show. Um, yeah. but, but this is, this to me is revelation 13 through and through. Cause right now what's happening is there are a lot of people who don't want to go through, uh, the mandates that have been told. And so what they're doing is they're counterfeiting these things, right? So, um, now what's happening is DHS is beginning to see the problem because DHS are the ones that are being tasked on making sure that, uh, quarantine directives and so on and so forth are being, um, uh, eventually they're going to be the ones that are going to be fully tasked for making sure that those things are being kept because they're doing it in the name of the security of the homeland, right? So yeah. um, this is a thing that's really interesting, right? This is a thing that kind of gets me all mind boggled. And that is a yeah. fact that there are people right now who are seeking to put together or who are, they're already doing it, putting together things that will uh, uh, basically counterfeit documentation. Hey, look, I did what I was asked to do. Here's my document that proves it. And yeah. and right now they have no way of authenticating or de-authenticating anything. So the talk right. is we need to go over to something electronic, um, something that is uniquely uh, cannot be counterfeited, but you understand yeah. how crazy the black market is, and the very second you put something together, the very second they're going to produce a counterfeit. So the way I read right. this is I, I believe that what they are doing here is they are um, uh, looking for somebody to create some kind of a protocol that's tied to hardware that cannot be duplicated on the black market. For example, it's got to have some kind of a very unique encryption mechanism uh, yes. that nobody knows the in-betweens, uh, that kind of a thing. So basically... Right. Um, this will this will take very this will be very very important in Revelation chapter thirteen so that nobody can buy or sell unless they have the mark of the beast. I think this is this is the system that's being prepared for that. Yeah, one hundred percent. And and the 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 thing that the key takeaway to this this one little one liner is the fact that it is non invasive and it's a real time detection. That I don't know if you've seen this, but um, there is a video out here that that uh, on YouTube. That is a digital tattoo, and it's basically uh, it it puts in these elements into your arm, and you can change that tattoo uh, through an app on your phone. And it it you can put whatever you want on your arm, and it also can give vitals. It can do all kinds of different things, uh, but it's embedded into your hand or your arm or your wrist or wherever you want it, um, and you can't see it, and 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 but they can, and so. Um, but uh, but you can also turn it on to be seen too. It's it's incredible technology, and so that to me is what they're doing. Uh, they're taking away the ability for you to put things away and not be connected, uh, and it's attaching to your person, and that is going to be the big game changer here. And so, uh, but yeah, that that is that's what you're seeing there. That is that's <laughs> yeah, it's and, crazy. I, and bro. Listen, it's and I think it goes even further than that in that yeah. um, once all that is implemented, it's like, how do we keep anybody from creating something that I can manipulate myself and trick the government into, 
not yeah. accepting or accepting. And I think that's what they're looking for. They want something that's foolproof. Yeah, yeah. It'll it'll be fully encrypted. Uh, it'll be attached to the person, so the person can't can't uh, you can't hand it to somebody else, so they can go out and use your pass to get something. It'll be tied to you, your DNA. It'll be it'll be tied in. Now, when I talk about the DNA aspects, remember DARPA, DARPA, the one who created Facebook, twenty, you know, all these other different uh, um, YouTube, uh, all the social profiles that we use. They also are the ones that created 23andMe and Ancestry.com, right? And so they're already mm -hmm. mapping DNAs. And so it'll be very, very easy if they've got all of your, your vitals and all your information and it's tied to you and your person, they'll have your DNA code too. Um, and so this is, that's exactly what that's coming to though. There's no way you can counterfeit it because it'll be tied to your DNA, you know? That's, and, and I think that that's absolutely crazy. Uh, but but I also think it's amazing because in Revelation 13 it says it's the number of man, right? It's 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 the mark of the beast. It is associated with the number of man, um, and it and it makes perfect sense. It and and even if it is one of these things, which actually I'm not even going to throw that thought out because I'm certain that it's going to be tied to DNA. I mean I think you're I think you're completely right. Um, yeah. Okay, DHS 221-004. Broadband push to talk interoperability platform. Now, this is kind of a big deal to me. Um, when I hear the word interoper interoperability uh, based on broadband, what I think this tells me is federalizing the nation's communication system. Um, yeah. I think I think it, it means nationalizing it, which basically cuts out private industry and all the red tape associated with uh, the privacy issues that people oftentimes come across uh, when they are members of government trying to get private information about people. I mean, I, what, what do you think about this? Yeah, this is actually a very in-depth comp structure. The, the police departments use something similar to that now, but on localized levels where, uh, you know, they, they, they have a certain radio frequency that they're talking on that's encrypted that they can actually go back and forth on that push to talk means that when they decide that you have uh, violated one of these policies uh, or been uh, exposed, uh, it'll be the push of a button really literally. Uh, uh, if you've seen the movie, the matrix where you see guys that have line of sight and all of a sudden they become the agent, you know, it's going to be along the same lines where if, if they key the mic, uh, uh, they're going to have you, eyes on you, locked down on you very rapidly because it'll be at the local uh, law enforcement level. Um, and that's, that's what that's set up. That is, that's basically gives them the ability to establish a dragnet within minutes versus, or actually seconds. Uh, it's not waiting for somebody to look at something in an inbox. It's not um, sending an email out or an alert that comes across their phone. It's basically... Uh, anybody that's in probably close proximity to you that is law enforcement, uh, they'll get a notification instantly um, when that has uh, taken place. So if you're trying to buy something and didn't have, you know, all the right credentials, uh, they could lock you down pretty quickly. So that's that's what I think is going on with that. Yeah, and I would agree. And and I think that once they nationalize um, the communication system, like you said, it gives them break in ability. There's all kinds of ability that they have that goes unchecked without any issues. And I think it's a pretty, uh, it's a, it's a pretty fast way to push the Overton window for privacy. And most people will look at that and say, huh, I really don't care. It's not that big of a deal. They're going to make it easier for us. It's going to be way cheaper. Heck, they might even propose this under the auspice of, well, the government will pay for your cell phone bill, which they're already doing on many levels. Right. And if yeah. they're paying for the cell phone bill, then they're also, uh, they also possess the right to be able, uh, to do that type of thing. Yeah, for sure. This will be free. They'll, they'll roll this thing out. It'll be, won't cost uh, the taxpayer. Well, we're already paying for it, but it won't cost them a dime. Uh, so there'll be no excuse for people saying, oh, I can't afford to do that. Uh, it'll be that for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. This one is scary too. DHS 221-005, a step towards agent agnostic detection of biological hazards. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's basically <laughs> if you've got this thing implanted on you, it has the ability to tell if you've been exposed, right? So it's basically gonna real time capture if you've been infected or exposed by something. So uh you think think smallpox, for example, right? If if um 
if you're if all of a sudden your your diagnostics you're showing a fever you're showing all the symptoms uh you, you've ever been to webmd right and you key in all your little symptoms and it tells you yeah you probably have you know whatever it may be right uh your sickness uh it tells you you know if this happens you need to call 911 and go see a doctor immediately all this stuff will be completely it'll it'll just flow like nothing you won't have uh, but in order to do a lot of this stuff, you're going to have to have a universal healthcare system. I believe that's going to be part of this. Uh, they'll roll it out because then they control everything, right? Yeah, hundred percent. And um, I mean, you have to keep in mind when you're talking about an agent agnostic detection. Okay, uh, that in essence means. I mean, this is. Uh, let me just take this a step further. That in essence means that I don't really have to participate in anything that they would want to find out about my own body. Because right. this isn't just scanning things at bays and airports and so on and so forth. This is them having the ability to be able to get information about you physically, biologically speaking, right? Without any type of agent that you have to say yes or no to. Right. This, is, this is them being able to just walk past you and figure out exactly what's going on. Right. Autonomic, man, is what they, I think autonomic is, is it basically, uh, it's going to be generating, uh, every, everything about you. And if there's anything that falls outside of the parameters established by the AI, um, algorithms, then, then, uh, it's going to notify them. You won't even know, you, you won't even know it's, it's, uh, sent things out on you. So, uh, that's probably the scariest part. Like I could be sleeping at night and all of a sudden I have a fever and, uh, I, you know, I wake up at two in the morning to go to the bathroom and I got uh, you, you got the uh, the guys knocking on your door to collect you and take you uh, to a new location for your safety. You know, what is it? Ronald Reagan said, I'm here from the government and I'm here to help. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Woo! That's that's the pot calling the kettle black or that's uh, having the fox watch over the hen house. You know what I mean? Exactly. It's uh, well, it's it's crazy, you know, and and, you know. Uh, again, you know, I am not some kind of a paranoid individual or anything like that, but I will just tell you, I will never trust our government ever, ever. No, the, the, no. Our constitution was written with the intent to remind people that we are not to trust the government, that we are the ones that govern, right? Yeah. Um, so it's interesting how that organization is supposed to be the very organization that serves us, yet uh, it's interesting how we are becoming the slaves of government, which is a huge problem. It's a, it's a big, big problem. So, um, yeah. okay. This one's yeah, another sure. one that bothers me. Okay. Yeah, the this next is, one. Yeah. yeah the ahead. 006 is, uh, talking about the airport checkpoint screening, uh, uh, limited mobility passengers. Yeah. So, you know, you think, oh, well, that's wheelchairs, you know, they're going to bring people through in wheelchairs so they can you know, or whatever it may be, but, uh, that it really doesn't, it, it goes way beyond that. Those are basically scanners that will, you have to pass through, uh, to tell if you've been, you know, if you've got that, that chip or that, that mark on you, um, you know, and so that's, that's what those, those are detecting. So that's how they catch people. Most people, I mean, you think about at any given point, you've got 10,000 planes in the sky over the United States. Right. And so on those planes, you probably average two to 300 people per aircraft. Uh, and, uh, and you think about those, if everybody's going through these scanners, uh, they're going to be able to control where you go <laughs> pretty quickly. And they're going to be able to identify you if you're a non-participant very quickly too. I agree. I think it's, it's, uh, we're going to see a lot of these types of technologies being deployed to control people's travel and they're doing it in the name of people with limited mobility. So for example, we want to be able to have something a little bit more invasive, for somebody who might be in a wheelchair. But before yeah. you know it, they'll be running regular citizens through that same technology in the name of convenience or everything else when in reality it was planned from the very beginning. It's actually pretty disgusting, but that's kind of where they're going with it. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, it's under that under that uh, it, that umbrella. Um, and it probably is because there is a, uh, they can say it in that manner um, and it's kind of broad brush because you can always scale things down to smaller sizes, but if you've got something that will cover somebody in a wheelchair, then it gives you a, a larger platform to work with. So yeah, the next one, man, that one, mass fatality tracking system, that right there, what that does is basically tells you when people go offline, right? If, if it's all 
in your skin and on your body embedded. You can't detach yourself from it. That that's what tells you that that's exactly what they're doing because uh, your phone, if I set my phone down on the, on the charger for at, at night, uh, it's not connected to my body and I die in my sleep uh, because I've got smallpox, right? There's no way for them to know that unless I am attached to the device. Um, and so that's how they know, you know, when people start going off the grid, uh, they'll have, they'll have right there. They, they have a real time tracking system. Yeah. And I think it's a very, you know, we, we can't get super graphic here, but I think it's a very nice way of saying we want to know uh, what people are doing. And I think you described it perfectly because when we see them stopping, when we see there's no activity, we need to be able to know what's going on. Um, yep. You know, we need to make sure it's not just you taking a shower when you put your phone down or going and taking a nap or something like that. I think I, I think that's a good read on it. A really good read on it. OK, yeah. this one. 221-008, next generation semiconductor based spectroscopic personal radiation detectors, which are known as SPURDS. Uh, we, we've heard this, tech, I've heard this many, many times. We've been, we've actually talked about this in the law enforcement world. Um, we've talked about uh, yeah. s- uh, spectroscopic personal radiation detectors. The thing that is a, uh, the, the game changer is the word semiconductor based. Right, because <laughs> most uh, spectroscopic analyzers that deal with radiation do not have anything that is solid state in them at all. Uh, right. This is kind of interesting, and I think there's some really interesting technological implications associated with this, particularly when it comes to the subject of retooling. Uh, that can yeah. be kind of scary because when you have something that has the ability. Uh, uh, a spectroscopic device that has the ability to uh, detect radiation and it's semiconductor base. It means that on the fly with a firmware update or with a simple change in ones and zeros, I can actually use the technology that is in that spectroscopic analyzer and use it for other mechanisms and tools, which I think is kind of crazy. And what it also does is it reduces significantly the size of, of the detection device. Yeah, 100%. This is, you're talking, this is all microelectronic realm, right? And so uh, for those not familiar with what that is, if you've ever gotten an x-ray um, and you see a, the, the x-ray tech walks up and they got this little uh, thing stuck to their shirt, uh, looks like a little white box or whatever, that alerts them to let them know their exposure uh, to x-rays, right? Mm-hmm. And so it's along those same lines is what this is, is really designed for. I see it as, as also an alternate way to also prevent tampering. Uh, if, say, for example, you were to be chipped uh, or tagged um, and you decided you wanted to figure out where that was exactly so that you could remove it, if you put that hand or whatever it is underneath, uh, you know, something that would show uh, that right there could also alert them the fact that you are, uh, you know, maybe x-ray in the area or doing something else. So I can see that as almost a twofold, you know, a double whammy for uh, their ability, you know, to go both ways, right? Uh, their ability to do things, manipulate things, but they're also uh, their ability to make sure that this uh, prevents any kind of tampering. Well, and that's so. the idea. When I, when I see it semiconductor based, it basically tells me, um, we can either set up a series of algorithms uh, yeah. into this thing, or we could, in essence, just simply using the broadband capability that we have, we could simply change its programming function on the fly. So, um, you know, w- this was something that got developed in the early 50s and 40s based on a technology called Tempest technology. A lot of people have never even heard that name, yeah, right? Uh, but it, it was, I'm, you've heard of this, right? You know exactly what all this stuff is. Uh, some of it, yeah, I know what you're talking about, but uh, I've never heard of Tempest. Okay, so what this stuff does, what this stuff does is it basically takes every single electromagnetic field that gets emitted from any device and it's able to create a reconstruction of whatever that device actually has done. It's all monitoring technology. So for example, it's based on the same principle of putting a laser on a window, right? 
You know, okay. the vibration of the window is able to give the person who has the laser on there the ability to listen to what's going on because yeah. it measures the little distances and recreates the waveform, right? Yeah. So the, the same idea is based in this type of technology in that what it did, um, it's very old now, there's much newer versions of it, but you could take a, a listening device that basically listened to um, the electromagnetic fields that let's say a printer produces when it, when it prints a, a piece of paper, when it presents, prints a document, and you could be able to reproduce what was printed on that document based on the, sc the scan technology, it hearing what all the devices are doing. I mean, all the chips and everything are doing, and it can actually reproduce something uh, that you just printed. Now, the technology has never been perfected completely, but I mean, it does work to the point where you know, they can get an overwhelming majority of information on your life, what you do, what you say, what you read, what you print, so on and so forth. And um, the, the, the thing that has always been the, I guess, the, um, the final frontier for that type of technology is the ability, the ability to retool on the fly, having uh, all the same ability, just needing to reprogram it, basically. All the same tools, but just needing to reprogram it. Well, the semiconductor-based uh, spectroscopic analyzers, uh, they're all made the same way. They're all designed to analyze certain areas of the spectrum, and the only thing you would technically need to retool are the things that were generally uh, analog based, right? So you'd have to, in the back of the day, you'd have to change a tube. You'd have to change, you know, other things um, to be able to scan a certain area of the spectrum. Well, now mm -hmm. you don't have to do that with semiconductor technology because it'll just simply do it on the fly, which is pretty okay. amazing. I mean, this is stuff that is like beyond even my ability to be able to comprehend. I just sort of know the outside scratch the surface part of all of this. But it's pretty amazing. It, and I'll give you an example of um, a modern day implementation of this that we have experienced personally as people uh, uh, involved in electronics. Like I'm an electronics guy. I'm a ham radio operator. I love all that stuff. I just love all that, right? My, my yeah. wife's present for Christmas, one of her presents, probably one of the best presents I ever had, was the Amateur Radio Relay League's uh, handbook. It's like seven volumes. It's got all kinds of RF theory, electronic theory, all that. I just love it, right? Um, so uh, where this is a practical application is um, when I wanted an oscilloscope, right, for a very specific, uh, very, um, I guess for lack of a better uh, term, calculated reason, I would spend you would have to spend thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars for a machine that was tuned to a certain to a certain frequency and if you wanted to uh look at any of the waveforms on any other uh spectrum you would have to buy another oscilloscope that was designed for that type of frequency right that was the yeah. way it was now you don't do that anymore now there is something that in essence is uh, for lack of a better term, it's it. We'll just call it solid state that has the ability to scan virtually all areas of the spectrum um, with the software retooling where it needs to focus. So th the idea behind them doing this with personal radiation detectors is crazy because what that means is they could take the type of technology that's utilized to passively scan information and they could in essence start actively scanning right um yeah a, 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 another great example of this is like uh if you take a motor that's a three-phase motor uh, let's just say it's a brushless motor um you can basically uh spin that motor and determine what the kilowatt rating is of that motor by spinning it at a certain speed and finding out what the voltage reading is coming out of the prongs that would actually receive power for the motor. So it can spit it out and receive it at the same time. It just depends on how you tool it, right? It's the, it's the same thing. Um, and I know I'm speaking over a lot of people's heads right now, but the, the point behind it is it allows you to be able to, um, and I have to be very careful because we're on YouTube, right? But it allows you to uh, retool this device to be able to scan for certain things in people's blood. Okay. So what you're saying, and let me, let me ask you this, uh, in a 5g environment, you could potentially become a human Bluetooth, so to speak device, right? You potentially. <laughs> yeah. What that? Potentially. And actually it, uh, believe it or not, as uh, people are making a lot of, uh, 
deal of the 5G thing, heck, man, you can do it in 3G technology, 4G technology. Yeah. All, all it means is fourth generation or fifth generation. And fifth right. generation just simply means that it's just a lot faster. It's, it's, it's deploying a lot of the same tools. But when, where this type of technology got perfected, it got perfected in the 3G and 4G world. So, yes. you know, everybody who's, you know, is kind of worried about upgrading to a 5G phone, you know, it, it, it really is superfluous. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so you were basically continuously connected to whatever it is based through these, through these, uh, whatever the bandwidth is, right? Yeah. And I mean, you can, it, in essence, it's something that can be retooled. It's, yeah, it's kind of crazy to me, you know, now <laughs> even, I bet you that there are vendors listening to this going, Oh, James, this sounds really, uh, too extreme or too paranoid, but Listen, if I had sat down a year and a half ago or two years ago and said that 190 something countries, 200 plus countries are all going to shut down at the same time and all these things are going to happen, you would have called me a total kook. You would have said, I lost my mind. I'm just a nut. Well, but you know what? Here's the thing. You think about it. When's the last time that everything shut down like that? 9-11 was another event where everything just went boom, like no air travel. Everybody locked down. Nobody did anything. Then you had it again. You had these big lockdowns. But what happens is it drives a behavior. So when you come out of that, 9-11, for example, what did we have? We had the Freedom of Information Act, or not Freedom of Information Act, um, uh, Patriot Act. The Patriot Act. Right, where they stood up Homeland Security. Uh, and then we gave up all of our freedoms. They basically became watching, you know, Big Brother, right? Watching every move that we make. Um, but it's things like that when they take shape, just like this recent stuff that just took place, um, that that pushes you into the next round. That's how they, you know, never let a, a, a good crisis go to waste. Right. And so oh, yeah. they take full advantage of that and they roll out their next platform and their agenda because everybody is willing to accept it because of fear. Right. Yep. Yep. hundred so, percent. And this is all the economy of the antichrist. This is all the world of revelation 13. That's what all of this is. It is you know, everything that we're reading. I mean, that's, that's, that's exactly what it looks like. And the thing that yeah. happened in nine 11 was unique in that all air traffic shut down over, uh, American airspace, but that didn't happen over international airspace. Right. Right. Uh, in right. some areas it did actually Canada shut down for a little while. Um, but, but the, but my point is, is that, um, like you said, the Overton window keeps getting pushed, right? So we've pushed yeah. it already. We've pushed it a few times. Um, you've got Patriot Act. That's been pushed. They've renewed it several times. Okay, okay, okay. Now we're at the point where the whole world is doing the same thing. They've coordinated their shutdown in essence. And, yeah. um, it, 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 you know, I'll just simply say this. It's almost like they've been rehearsing for this for years. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, yeah. I, guess, yeah. I, I guess we'll leave that be. So, um, okay, DHS 221-009. Uh, field forward diagnostic for select agent list toxins. Now, I'm, I'm going to, well, I'm going to just open it up to you to talk about this because it's the next one that we're leading into that there's a lot of panic over, which there should be in some ways, but there's a lot of misinformation going on about that, right? So we'll, we'll yeah, just talk yeah. about that really quickly. But let's get into field forward diagnostics for select agent yeah. list toxins. Yeah, for sure. So so let me back up a little bit. Uh, as you know, I came off of, of the F-35 program, right? And part of that program is uh, in the global sustainment world, right, is having diagnostics. So when an airplane is flying and it has a part that's broken on it, the airplane autonomically sends a notification to a forward locate, you know, forward base. So when that airplane lands, the part to fix that problem is already there, right? So what this is, is this is the same type of concept where let's say, for example, I'm on an airplane, I'm flying somewhere, uh, and all of a sudden I've been exposed, I've got a fever, and now I've just exposed everybody on the airplane. That's gonna that 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 forward diagnostics is basically sending out an alert to my, my destination, letting them know that these are, this is what I have. This is my symptoms. And they, it, it's basically letting them know when I land. So I, in essence, become the part, right? Where in, in, with the aircraft, you know, the aircraft lands, the part is coming inbound autonomically. Nobody even, the pilot doesn't, doesn't even know it's an error. He just lands, they park the plane, they fix the plane. He gets back on. In this case, you are you become the part in essence, 
right? And so it auto automatically is sending diagnostics out on your on your issues and you don't even know what's going on. So that's exactly what that is. Well, so and it opens up the door again for the loss of freedom. It, it yeah. opens up the door again for people to be able to say, oh, well, we detected that something is going on with you. And in order to save your life and the life of people around you, we're going to have to detain you here. Yeah, yeah. You remember the, the movie that uh, Tom Cruise was in when he was uh, in the Office of Future Crimes or whatever it was. Uh, I forget the name of that movie, but um, but this is along the same lines. Like, well, we're arresting you today because you're going to commit a crime tomorrow at 12 p.m., right? It's, That's right? it's kind of along those same lines where you are developing all of these algorithms that we have, you know, preset through our, through our AI. Um, and that, uh, based on those algorithms, we know that tomorrow at X amount of time, you're going to have a full blown fever. You're going to fully be infecting everybody. Um, and that that's, that's what the premise of this is. It, it has to do with, with your health and, and your future health. Right. And so, uh, but, but it, it goes way beyond that. This isn't just for, health monitoring. This is actually the system that will, that will parlay itself into, uh, if you've got this now we can control, uh, because we're now under one monetary system, we can control what you buy and what you sell, you know, everything, whether you work, whether you don't work, it's all of that. Right. And we can see those trends coming into play now. Yeah. This is such good. It's good analysis, bro. Really good analysis. Me and you are so stinking like-minded, it's not even funny. Okay, <laughs> DHS 221-010. Uh, now, I'm going to bring this up because th this one, there's a lot of misunderstanding on this. And um, I, I, I'll just tell you this before I read this. I have a view that when people sensationalize certain things by going um, overboard on the analysis and saying things that aren't even... Uh, related to the context, you actually cheapen the significance of the subject that you're talking about, right? So most people can pay, you know, it's, it's, um, it, you can pay so much attention to the noise that's being made that the real killer gets ignored. And then in essence, you end up uh, missing the point, right? So uh, yeah. this is a big one because when we talk about wearable detector for, uh, aerosolized, uh, and I always get that wrong, right? Um, aerosolized chemical threats. Yeah. Oftentimes people will read this one and will start talking about the chemtrails and all of that stuff. So maybe we should, yeah. maybe we should talk about what chemtrails are um, and what really is going on there. And maybe we should also talk about, and I know it get, it's like, it's one of those areas that we get into and, and everybody just starts going a little nuts um, yeah. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I think that a lot of that stuff, uh, there is some reality to it as it relates to weather and so on and so forth. But um, I, can I, can I, I'll just make this one statement. Um, my wife came to me and told me uh, recently we're driving and she says, honey, you see that airplane way up high in the air? Uh, it, it, they're leaving like a trail behind them. It's like a little trail. And it's been happening a lot lately, you know, this winter, like I've been seeing it a lot and I go, babe, most of the time, what that actually is, is that is a, uh, a natural phenomenon that takes place when the yeah. wing uh, touches, makes contact with the air. The, depending yeah. on the area of attack, it creates sort of a natural cloud trail that creates yeah. that. It's not poison being put in the air. It's not a fuel dump. You know, sometimes fuel dumps happen and sometimes things get, yeah. do get put in the air. But what yeah. you're seeing for the most part is typically... A, a, a reflection of un unstable air, correct? Well, no, it, it actually goes a little further than that. The engines actually, because the engines are uh, at an at an altitude where the temperature outside is like negative 45 degrees. Yep. Uh, you've got an engine that's pushing out several thousand degrees, like two, 3000 degree Fahrenheit, right? And so uh, um, when the air comes into the engine very cold and it goes out the back, if there's any moisture content in the air, it'll actually create a, a cloud and it's called a contrail. And that's, that's really what you see. Now you do get them off the winglets too, uh, where you're flying and you'll see that actually that little spin will come off the end of the tips of the wings. Uh, it happens with fighters all the time. And it's just the way that they're cutting the air and it just creates that, that, uh, that same effect. And so, yeah, that's, that is not, so 
when you see aer aerosolized chemical threats, you know, you look at this as a, as a broad brush and you go, oh, well, the government's trying to protect me from biological and chemical threats, right? And so I'm going to walk around, you know, 340 million of us are going to walk around. And if any of us get exposed to any of these things, uh, it's going to basically let them know that we've been exposed. That is really, that takes the whole thing out of context. Um, and it's really not part of the scope of this. Uh, that's not what they're intending here. Uh, I see that as if you're trying to remove the device that they put on you, those chemicals, uh, if you're spraying stuff onto your skin, alcohol, whatever, you're trying to, to get rid of what is on your skin, like a tattoo, uh, a bleach or any kind of chemical, that's going to send them a notification. That's how I see that. Uh, it's not as, as crazy as, you know, uh, how, you know, chemtrail stuff, right? It's a little yeah. bit uh, less in scope and it's all tied to this device. That's the thing that they don't, they don't talk about this device chipping you and putting, you know, on you, they talk around it because these are all key, and key enablers to the one thing that's going to tie it all together, which is that device, right? And, and, I, and I also want to point out that if the government or anybody else wants to expose us to chemicals that are going to damage us, the least effective way to do that is to put it in the air at 35,000 feet, right? Yeah. The, the most effective way you're going to do that is in a subway. It's going to be in a car, you know, it's going to be yeah. different. It's going to be that way. Um, and don't get me wrong. I do think that they do release chemicals in the mm -hmm. air. And I think that it's done do. as you've talked to me about this, it, you know, they control weather and different things like that, but um, poisoning a whole group of people. I mean, it, it, it's not even an effective way to hurt anybody long-term or short-term. It doesn't even work. Yeah. Yeah. The planet does a pretty good job at cleaning up on a lot of that stuff, right? Just, uh, you know, God's intelligent design. I mean, you know, that's why we have trees that keep the air clean and, uh, but, but they do, uh, there's no doubt about it. I, it's funny because I will, if I ever talk, I've talked about this one time in one video and I was like, I'm never doing it again because, uh, it just, people went sideways. It's like the flat earthers. Right. And, um, but, but it's, uh, they do do it. There ain't no doubt about it. They do cloud seeding, which is another mechanism uh, for manipulating weather. Um, there, it, it is done. You've had whistleblowers come out and do it. And so I've said that. And then people are like thinking that I'm saying that they don't do it. They do do it. But that's not what we're, ta what we're talking about here. Um, and so that's that's it's just out of scope, I guess, is the whole point of this. Right. Yeah. And I think it's kind of an important thing to, to talk about. Um, OK. This one's another interesting one, and uh, let me move it to where people can actually see it, and I'll, I'll turn it back here. Uh, this is a DHS 221-011 from port side to pen side. Um, Low-cost detection slash diagnostics for high-consequence transboundary trans or nationally reportable animal diseases, particularly those with zoonotic propensity. All right. What's your thought on this? I got a lot to say about this one too, but I don't you know. What, 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 what You look at some of these infectious diseases that are out there, look at monkey pox, look at um, Ebola, look at smallpox. Um, basically what they're doing is they're, they're, they're trying to, to make this where they can contain what they're about, in my opinion, about to release on the world. I, and I think um, the low cost side of it, they, the money is irrelevant to them. They print money like it's nobody's business. Uh, but that, that is in essence, what they're, what they're going to try to do is to tie this in. It'll have certain parameters that are, that are pre-established within this, this, uh, AI system, uh, that through all the diagnostics that will detect if you've been exposed to something, my feel, uh, and this is going to sound a little bit, uh, tinfoil hat. Um, but when you look at the other bid that just came out, by uh, Health and Human Services uh, that has the exact same due date as this. Uh, there is a bid that came out where they are wanting to procure 280 million doses of smallpox vaccination. And so uh, the due date on that proposal is the same as the due date on the one we just reviewed, which is December 14th. Uh, so it's already passed uh, for the initial um, uh you know, yeah, I'm interested in bidding this and they go to the bidders conference, right? Um, they're all on the same timeline. Uh, my fear is that because of that, you know, you're talking about smallpox, which is a, which falls into the, the criteria and categories that we just discussed. 
on that last bullet, right? Mm -hmm. um, that uh, that would tell me that they more than likely are, you're going to see that uh, roll out into the world. Uh, you've seen it. Uh, if you go over to John Hopkins um, and you just key in the word dark winter and, and go to John Hopkins, it will actually, you can read through the whole thing. And it talks about air travel. It talks about uh, what would happen if you were to introduce smallpox in today's mobile environment? Um, and that's exactly the whole study. It's a simulation, just like we've talked about in the past, where they continue to run simulations on different things, a financial collapse, uh, Event 201, uh, Vision 2030, uh, Dark Winter, right? Um, and, and they do, what they do is they run it through a simulation model that tells you what the, what the prob uh, probability outcome is going to be, right, statistically. And so uh, for Dark Winter, the rollout on that bad dude for smallpox was uh, it was pretty it basically wiped out a very large portion of the world. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, very large portion, like like uh, uh, it was it's <laughs> it, it, not a lot of people left uh, because it, it is so uh, it's such a uh, you know, you got to think about it. Smallpox hasn't been uh, it was actually uh, the, the World Health Organization actually. Um, deemed it, uh, what is it, ratified or whatever. Um, Eliminated, uh, yeah. 19, Pretty much it's it's dead. It's, um, yeah, in 1980. Yeah, correct. Yep. Yeah, the last the last uh, person to have it, or last one to have it, I think was in 1978 or something. But they haven't, they haven't, um, people have not been vaccinated for smallpox since 1972. Uh, that was like the last time in the United States that they actually started, you know, vaccinating people for it eradicated is the word I'm looking for. Yeah. And so once it was eradicated, they quit vaccinating for it. And so, um, and so that looks to be, like I said, it's kind of all ties together with this. Yeah. It's, uh, it's unbelievable. I think that it all goes back to pushing the Overton window to make these types of measures acceptable to the general public. So that when we see the economy of the antichrist, um, it's, it's just going to fly through. And I think this is something that we've all talked about. Um, we've talked about this a lot, uh, me and you yeah. and Tom, and, and it's the idea that, um, when Christians are raptured, everything that's holding everything back is gone. I mean, the Holy Spirit living inside of believers has been, in essence, the restraining force. There won't right. be any monkeys out there. There won't be any Jameses or Toms. Uh, there yeah. won't be Don Stewarts. There won't be J.D. Farages. There won't be lots of people that are out there um, right. uh, that are uh, Don Perkinses. And there's lots of people out there that are talking about this stuff. There won't be these people um, right. uh, speaking about these things. And so in essence, it's going to become more palatable. It's going to become more acceptable. It's going to become more commonplace. Yeah. And, yeah. That voice of reason will be gone for sure. Yep. Yep. And so with, when, when there is no restraining force and there continues to be a harden a hardness of heart for the spirit of God, um, it's a wrap. I mean, it's, it's just such a bad thing. And uh, we're going to watch this world get very, 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 very dark. And we talked about this. You know, um, we went over this. I think it was last Sunday that we went over this. Maybe it wasn't. No, sorry. It was maybe the Sunday before uh, where yeah. we talked about the seals, uh, the seal judgments. And we talked about yeah. the first four seal judgments, which right now I'm doing a series on uh, five-minute videos. Uh, but the, the seal judgments, when you look at, at the introduction of the white horse, the red horse, the black horse, and the pale horse, every single one of those horses, right, whether it be uh, the Antichrist, whether it be the failure of the economy, whether it be death, uh, whether it be war, uh, any of those things that are going on, all of this is happening as a result of the failure of man to capitulate or to listen and hear and obey the voice of God. These are all, all four of these are all man-made uh, things, right? Man yeah. made this, man dis uh, created this destruction, right? Um, yeah. and, and it's interesting because we're seeing a, a microcosm of this. We're watching this happening on a much smaller level, uh, throughout the history of mankind. We bring on famine, we bring on war, we bring on death. Um, we bring on these, um, for lack of a better term, these antichrists, 
uh, because we know that when we talk about the Antichrist of Revelation 13, he's the final Antichrist, but we bring on the same thing. It always, you know, you bring on these Antichrist type dictators, you bring in mass death. I mean, under communism alone, we've lost, I think the estimate is, is close to, uh, or as much as 300 million lives under the rule of communism, right? I mean, imagine, imagine losing 2 billion lives during the course of these four seals being broken, right? That's when the pale horse comes in. You're going to lose almost 2 billion lives. I mean, well, that would fit. That would fit with the dark winter model, right? Yep. If that look at what that whole DHS thing that we just looked at in essence is the pale horse, right? That is, that would be uh, really what you're expecting to see because as soon as that technology is enabled the next step is, is to dovetail all that into the beast system right that's right which yep. is 13 and, and right? i think i think and and the thing that that's revelation 13 and the thing that scares me uh well it doesn't scare me it kind of excites me but it scares me for people that don't know the lord is the fact that we are literally on the cusp of this we're entering into we this system i i entitled uh, the video uh, that we did for today, uh, 2022 will be a picture of things to come. And that's not a good thing, right? That's yeah. not, that, that is not a good statement, right? It's, it's, we know that things are going to get way worse. We know they are. By the way, they demonetized us. I forgot to tell you that. Oh, they yeah, already they, did? Yeah, they already did. They already said, you know, oh. add suitability or whatever. We'll fight it. But, you know, it's okay. It's more about the message. Um, but it's, that's the, that's the thing that we're talking about here. It's like, we, this is a picture of the things that we're going to see coming and it's not good. No, it's not. It's not. And that's, but don't worry. Hey, you know what? God's going to remonetize you. So don't worry oh, about yeah, that. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, no, but I mean, but we're talking about all this stuff. Oh, God has been so faithful, bro. I, you know yeah. what? I, I've always had a kick telling people because people are like, well, James, why don't you take an offering at your church? Because we don't take an offering. We just have a box in the back. And if people want to yeah. give, they just give. Uh, yeah. Because I, I love watching God come through for me. And, and yeah. bro, he does. He does it all the time. He's come through for our church. He comes through for, for us. He's always been faithful, bro. And I, yeah. look, on if you, op- if you look at my wedding ring, on my wedding ring, it has my name on it, and it has Nicole's name on it, and then it says Ephesians 3.20. And it basically is the passage where it talks about God is capable of giving us beyond anything we could possibly imagine or hope for. That's, that's how God is. He's faithful, yeah. right? Um, but I'm telling you, bro, what we have coming, the world that we are walking into right now, anybody who thinks we're going to go back to normal, that's crazy. Yeah, we're beyond normal. It's, it is not going to return. Um, unfortunately, uh, you know, God's will be done. Simple as that. Uh, but, you know, look at, look at what's going on right now with China. And, it, you know, it's not getting a ton of press coverage. Not a lot of people talking about it, uh, except for the people that are, are the experts in the fields, right? Like supply chain. Uh, they're looking at uh, the stuff, the economic woes that China is having right now are going to ripple effect through the rest of the world. Uh, you know, it's it's uh, you're right. We're right on the cusp. 2021, 2022. It's the next Shemitah cycle, man. It's getting ready to be the double whammy because because they just they're hoarding their grain and they, they've they've hoarded 50 percent half of the grain that's available that they that they distribute around the world. And so. You just took all of 50, half the, the the grain that the world uses is out of play right now yep. uh, because of their hoarding, because they see uh, this giant economic whammy coming on them in the very near term. Right. Um, and so the, the they've told their people, they've said, you guys need to start stocking up, uh, start prepping, so to speak. Uh, so it is <laughs> it's it's the, and, and that's going to ripple effect. It's going to impact us. Uh, you know, the U S because we buy a lot from them. Um, they're actually starting to hoard commodities, you know, things like copper, things like, uh, titanium, things like steel, coffee. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. They're hoarding a lot of stuff. Uh, it's because they're trying to do self-preservation. Um, and that's the thing too. My wife and I, last night, we're talking about the ships that, that, that come off, you know, into long beach. Uh, we're talking about the span of time and, and, uh, it used to take a boat, a ship you regularly takes, it just kind of get walk you through the span of a ship container ship. Okay. Um, 
it takes them almost 30 days to load a container ship. And, and let's just say the average is 2,000 containers on a ship. And that's a, a medium sized ship. They, yeah, they some of them over 3,000, yeah. right? Um, but it takes them 30 days to, to actually load that ship, get the containers full, get the ship loaded, and then they send it on its way. And that ship can take, depending on the speed, currents, all the other things, anywhere from 15 days to 30 days to get to uh, Long Beach or Los Angeles. So you've got 30 days and then you've got another 15, let's say in best case scenario, that's a 45 day span. Once it gets to Long Beach or Los Angeles, it sits now out off the shore for 17 days before they even get it in to unload it, right? They bring it in, they unload it. Unloading goes a lot faster, but then once they're done unloading it, it now has to travel back with that empty container for replenishment back to uh, China. And That's so right. you add another 17 days on top of the 45 it just took to get there, plus another 15 to get it back. You know, the average, it turns out to be... Uh, some crazy it's like 77 days before that that cargo container shows back up and in the long term it's 107 days before that cargo container makes it back to china to be replenished and they're running out of cargo containers because they're sitting in our docks uh waiting to be unloaded and so that is impacting their their economy big time because they are you know even if they tried to get it out faster they can't they have they don't have the means to get it here any faster because the cargo containers are occupied <laughs> to the yeah, tune of and, about 250,000 of them. And we're seeing it like so much. I know every time I go in a Starbucks line or I buy something from a, from a restaurant and I actually ask for what I want and they tell me they don't have it, which happens a lot more now than it used to. Matter of fact, it never used to really happen. Now it happens every time I go. Um, yeah. I just, I just say when I get up to the person that I pay for, I just say, uh, thank you flashbang. That's what I say. You know, yeah. thank flashbang, you know? Yeah. It's incredible. Look at the cost. Uh, if you go to a grocery store right now, look at the cost of like a honey crisp apple used to be able to buy those about 35 cents a pop. Uh, they're a dollar and a quarter for a single apple. Now, honey crisp apple dollar 80. If you buy it out here in Southern California. Oh, wow. It's incredible. The dollar fill 80. up your gas tank. You, they have a surgeon standing by with a cooler, uh, waiting to remove your kidney. Uh, to pay for the gas, you know, if oh, you yeah. fill up your truck, it's yeah. absolutely insane. You're paying, how much in Texas are you paying for gas per gallon? Uh, it's about three eighty a gallon, I think, uh, for, for 93 octane. Wow. Um, if, if you could sell 93 octane, so 91 octane is how much? Uh, 91 is probably about three and a quarter, something like you that. You would have, you would have a line that went out to Kalamazoo in California if you could buy gas for three and a quarter right yeah. now, you're buying gas for almost five bucks a gallon, bro. Oh, that's crazy. It's crazy. And that for the common person, I mean, most people like my truck, you know, it, it, it costs me probably, uh, it's close to a hundred dollars to fill my truck up. Yeah. Dale, yeah. Dale, Dale spends about a buck 30 to fill up his van. Oh, it's incredible. It's incredible. And if you have to commute every single day, driving back and forth, uh, and you're not getting, you know, you're getting 12 to 15 miles a gallon, uh, you're going to, you just took a pay cut, a big one. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And right now, any of these big gas guzzling cars are beginning to drop in price like a rock. Um, and actually, that's not true of trucks. Trucks are the only exception. Right now, a used truck is almost as much as a new one now, which is just crazy. I, yeah. I heard, I was told by somebody who um, is very dear to me, somebody that I love tremendously, who's a high-level manager over at Honda. And he tells me that right now, um, nothing is going for, you know, 12, 13, 15, 18, 19,000 above MSRP. Nothing is. That's crazy. And if you're getting the family price where they just love you and they're just pretty much giving you the farm and they're taking out all their, all their profit and everything, uh, you're paying about 1,000 above MSRP. Yeah. Yeah, I could see that. Uh, I, I ordered a, a, a new car back in August uh, and I still haven't gotten it. So. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and did you, did you pay a lot above MSRP? No, I didn't actually. I'm kind of surprised, but I will tell you my truck value uh, is, uh, is holding it, its own pretty well. And so I'm looking at uh, when I do sell that truck, 
you know, uh, because of the gas. I'm just trying to get something that's more economical. Um, but, but yeah, it's uh, my, used cars are where all the money is anyway, right? There's Man, they have more margin. A, I can't imagine monkey without a truck. It doesn't make yeah, sense. Yeah, I know it's going to be really strange because I haven't driven a car in a long time. But, uh, uh, but yeah, it's it's um, you know my wife's got a truck and it's it, the, between the two of them, our big trucks taking up the driveway. You know we do get hail season here in Texas and uh, anything that's outside just gets demolished. So I'm I, you know. I can't get it. They, they won't fit in the garage. No, and besides crazy. my garage is my shop. So can't really park anything in there anyway. So. Yeah. I'm the same thing. I'm, 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 uh, I, I got rid of a, I had a truck forever and I got yeah. rid of it. The last truck I had was a 1999 Chevy Silverado. And, uh, ever then, ever since then I've, I've been doing like SUVs and that kind of thing. But you know, I don't know. Uh, if I get a truck, it won't be for a long time because these trucks are costing as much as houses now. Yeah, they are exactly. That's uh, that's what I'm finding is um, they uh, it's it's absolutely insane. Five months to get a vehicle is is crazy, uh, and most of these places when you go up to the car lot now you cannot get uh, you just can't get a you don't get a car and drive off the lot. It's no, it's a wait. You yeah, know, unheard. you order it and it'll be here in six months. You know. Yeah, I went through uh, a lot and 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 a lot of hard work and labor uh, to get my wife a minivan that hasn't come in yet either. And it's for our children, you know, but it's it's been crazy. But the good news is, is her vehicle will just keep going up in value. The vehicle that she currently drives, you know. Yeah. Um, well, the other downside, too, is that uh, if you have a problem, say your, your, you know, check engine light comes on or something. They don't have the ability to repair them because they don't have the, the parts. They can't get the yep. parts. And that's why I just decided that I was going to get a new one for that very reason because of how crazy things are right now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my, my wife's truck, I, I uh, called, set up an appointment for service. It's a Ford. And uh, they, they, they uh, sent me an email back. They didn't even call me. They just sent me an email and said, we can't service her truck because we don't have a mechanic that can work on diesels right now. And so... Uh, and that's a Ford dealership. Think about that. <laughs> People don't want to work. Ford, Ford, bro. Yeah. It's a Ford. Yeah, exactly. Oh. Incredible. Used to be you could get those parts a dime a dozen. I mean, that's like the thing that just, uh, oh, it just kills me. Yeah. It's oh. amazing. It just kills me. All right. Yeah. Well, let's take some questions, shall we? Because I think we're kind of at that time. I want to make a recommendation if you guys have not done so. Um, I would highly recommend that you go to monkeyworksus.com and that's W-E-R-X and uh, look at Monkey's latest blog. It's phenomenal. He does a really, really, really good job. Uh, starts this article off with military installations and what's going on. The thing that I want to encourage you with with these blogs that you're going to read is they're not typical conspiracy theory type blogs. They all offer hope because we are talking about Christ. And, um, and the hope that leads to him. So we've got a lot of questions coming in as they do, as we prepare. Remember, it's question in all caps, and then give us your uh, questions. I want to go really quickly to some of our Super Chats and acknowledge them because while we've been talking, I haven't had the chance to do so. So I'd like to do that um, really, really quickly. And Catman82375, you say you're in the hospital uh, right now with uh, a Dexcom G6 that monitors my diabetes, uh, wear it for 10 days at a time uh, that my...